As I mentioned um, a couple of weeks back, that the that tutorial will be done, and that will cover the most important topics that we uh, cover towards the end of this this semester on the uh, foreign trade and investment uh, class. So um, today we will look at the uh, three main areas of the uh, international trade or foreign trade law and the, 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 those areas are uh, actually within the WTO dispute settlement process, san uh, sanitary and phytosanitary measures and technical barriers to trade. Now um, I decided to look at this because I feel that there, there, was, there are areas where agreements that the member countries of WTO sign play a very important role in terms of in terms of uh, trade, uh, more on the import and export aspect of the business. So the first part of this uh, tutorial, um, we will look at the uh, WTO dispute settlement uh, process. Uh, okay, WTO uh, dispute, dispute settlement process. Just for your information, it's uh, it's the area that I. I wrote my uh, doctoral thesis on, and there's going to be a book published on that topic, uh, which is right now in the editing process. As soon as that is done, uh, end of this month, uh, I will sit with the the uh, book manager of the uh, University of the South Pacific Press to go through the final touches and then have it printed. And so it will become hopefully one of the uh, reading guides for this course for students who are going to enroll and study LW373 uh, in the years to come. Now, let's continue with our, our discussion uh, on the uh, WTO dispute settlement mechanism. Uh, the basic question, really, in terms of WTO dispute settlement mechanism uh, relates to, you know, what do members need or why? Why do they need, members of WTO need dispute settlement uh, mechanism, all right? Now, it is, it is to do with rules in relation to where there is dispute amongst or dispute between members of WTO. And so they go to WTO court. And so the settlement mechanism is more like a body that, that uh, receives complaints and, and they, um, they go through the process of trying to find ways Using the rules, right? Using the rule system because WTO, as you know, it's a rule-oriented uh, system. It is, it is not a legal system, so to say. Legal system, as you know, it's a setup of various institutions that try to promote the rule of law. But for WTO, uh, a WTO system, it is to do with rules that members need to follow in order to do business amongst themselves. And so WTO. Uh, dispute settlement mechanism, all right? Uh, most of it, if not all, uh, is centered around rules that are in place for members who want to bring disputes before the WTO dispute body. They have to follow the rules in order to get, you know, you know the uh, dispute body, dispute settlement me mechanism body set up to, to decide on the issues, the legal issues that are brought before the the WTO mechanism. And so the process that are uh, involved or uh, the states, status in terms of WTO um, process is that, you know, the first is consultation, you know, where there are, if the two members of WTO have issues and so they, they feel that they need to be heard by the body, the requirement, all right, the rule says there has to be consultation. Uh, between the two member countries, they have to consult each other and find ways to resolve the matter within, right? Within you know their capacity or within their competence, you know, use their own uh, approach and try to find ways to you know understand and understand each other's uh, position and try to come up with a 
a uh, amicable solution so that both can continue with their business under the WT rules. Now, if that fails, all right, if that f fails, then they they uh, will ask to have the uh, the bodies uh, set up a a panel, and the panel uh, is is comprised of learned, all right, learned inter international trade lawyers, economists who know about the WT or this resolution mechanism and then the rules and agreements that the members have agreed to to, to abide by, they will, um, you know, the members of the panel will come from that, that sort of uh, stream or that uh, spectrum. And then if the panel fails, then the matter goes to the appellant body. It's more, more like the highest body that will hear uh, the, the, the dispute. If one party is not happy with the decision of the panel, that party appeals to the appellant body. And the appellant body now will not necessarily uh, look at the facts and, and, and uh, the situation, but will just look at the rules, whether the rules were followed in arriving at the, uh, the decision. If not, then the panel may overturn the decision of the uh, the the appellant body may overturn the decision of the the panel so that's the you know the stages where the matter goes through to 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 uh to settlement through that process consultation panel and an appellant body now i have a uh, video that i'd like you to have a look and just listen to what the uh this uh, expert right is a professor of of law uh, in international trade law, he's, uh, he teaches at the uh, Georgetown or University of Washington, and he's, uh, he has written a lot of books and articles and papers, and he has commented. He has a lot of commentaries on on WTO, more particularly on the uh, dispute settlement mechanism. And so, I'd like you to listen to him while he takes you through the process, and it is more like an interview. There is this uh, gentleman with him asking him questions and is responding in trying to address the issue of, of a WTO dispute settlement mechanism. Hello and welcome. Over the last five decades, few scholars have been as influential in the realm of international trade as John Jackson. As a professor at Michigan and now at Georgetown University, John Jackson has influenced generations of trade negotiators, lawyers, and other officials. His remarkable body of written work has provided a foundation, an intellectual foundation for the WTO and particularly for its dispute settlement system. Today, Professor Jackson teaches international trade law at the Georgetown University Law School. John Jackson, welcome. Thank you very much. The WTO's dispute settlement system is handled roughly 440 cases now. Did you ever envisage two, three decades ago that we would have a system that would be this active? I think not. Uh, it's very hard to put oneself back several decades, for instance. I knew there was a, a way that there would be ripe activity in, in the area. I felt all along that it was very important to have a rule-based system important uh, internationally, but important for business and so on. Uh, but to, to imagine or to realize how deeply enmeshed we came into the dispute settlement system, with the dispute settlement system, has really been quite remarkable. We now really have, in the WTO, the most powerful dispute settlement system at the international level that exists, when you walk through the different elements to it. And that power itself has attracted usage. Uh, sometimes the usage goes to an extent where one gets a little bit nervous about using it in those ways uh, because you can really sort of get offline and into things that are very, very tough to handle. Is there a danger it could be a victim of its own success? Yes, there is such a danger. Mm -hmm. Particularly with the Doha round now at an impasse, if you think of the trade negotiations element of our work as the legislature, yes, there's a threat that perhaps we could find ourselves legislating through the judiciary? That, I have written about that. Actually, in my writing, I raise that as, as a warning. Hmm. Uh, not, not yet to fruition yet, hopefully, 
I don't think there's been an, something you could call an abusive overreaching, but it, it really is a risk. As you start to see with the trade monitoring reports that we've been issuing, uh, protectionism rising. Uh, in fact, the last report showed that it had gone up to about 3% of global imports now being impacted. Do you think this creates again a threat that we might find the system getting perhaps clogged with, with too many cases, uh, putting pressure on the system and, um, and, and leading people to wonder whether this is in fact sustainable? Well, that's, that's true. All of what you said is true. I, I don't think we have quite as dangerous a situation as some people might call for. And the 3% of trade figure is, can be challenged, of mm -hmm. course. Mm -hmm. uh, there really has been quite a remarkable hesitation to get too, protect too much protectionism, given the impact of the events of the last uh, three or four years, which mm -hmm. have been pretty amazing. So you can say there's, there's something of a, a uh, success that has gone on in holding back too much. On the other hand, we could be on the verge of things that would be uh, much more mean, and uh, that we have to watch out for. John, what about the emergence of the so-called 21st century issues that uh, we've seen, whether it's uh, investment issues or uh, trade and environment, the evolution of different kinds of media, for example, uh, uh, internet commerce. Do you see the possibility that at some point these issues might be brought before the dispute settlement system? Well, that's happening. Yeah. And the question is, is that going to work? Is that going to get beyond the, the really important competence of the system? Mm -hmm. Because after all, it is a legalistic and people use the term legalistic uh, with opprobrium <laughs> quite often. Mm. Uh, this is a legalistic system. Now, I say it's a rule-oriented system, and most of us that work in the area it, it notice the importance of rule orientation, uh, the, the predictability and uh, lowering of the risk premium uh, so it makes uh, business uh, more uh, able to function more appropriately, et cetera. But th there is a real risk when we, when we can't get a decision-making process going that, that be partly because we depend so much on the consensus rule. When you see discussions, negotiations in other fora, uh, climate change, for example, or, or financial regulation, right. these are areas which, which, while the WTO may not have this as its core business, trade and WTO activity does intersect with these areas. Do you see there being a risk that somehow, for example, in the question of climate change or other environmental issues, that the WTO system could be put under pressure uh, as a result of, as you say earlier, a failure to get decisions uh, among members in, in <coughs> important negotiating fora? That is certainly true. Uh, there, there is that problem already. Uh, <clears throat> what is interesting to, to me, very personally, uh, is the interaction of financial services to the trade area. And in fact, we did a, a volume uh, dedicated to issues like that in the journal that I edit, the Journal of International Economic Law. Uh, so we did a whole volume of about um, 20, 22 or some odd uh, essays that are probing that issue. Is there a relationship be with the trade area and financial services? Now, underneath this is as one of our essays, essays uh, indicated, a, what we could call a hatred of the trade people compared to the financial services people. <laughs> the financial services people tend to, to fly first class, you see. The, I see. the trade people tend to uh, not be so well off. And, uh, mm -hmm. and there's a lot of tensions there that are really kind of, we can laugh, but you know, they cause real harm because right. the sort of, uh, problems of financial services, which are the horrendous problems of the day, I think, mm. uh, can really make life pretty miserable for, and is making life pretty miserable for millions and millions of people all over the world. Why is it that in other, <clears throat> in other international fora, other multilateral uh, institutions, why is it that they have been unable to develop a dispute settlement system similar to what we have here? Or, or put another way, why was it that at the WTO this succeeded where in other places it hasn't, it hasn't worked? That's a wonderful question. I wish I, I wish I could answer it with great elucidation. 
but I was experiencing it, this over those many decades, actually. And I remember how uh, minimal we, it started out, you know, with the GATT itself, and how consensus uh, ruled to the point that when there was a GATT panel r ruling that came down, it had to be approved by the contracting parties by a consensus vote, which meant that the, the person that was in the wrong could block mm. the ruling. Mm. Now that, that in the middle 80s, you know, everybody knew that had to be corrected, and mm. that was corrected in the Uruguay round. And somehow it got corrected with m motivating into this tremendously power operation that we, powerful operation that we now have in the uh, trait in the uh, rule-oriented system. Uh, there's just uh, a very elaborate procedure. We have the so-called reverse consensus that prevents the consensus rule from stymieing the uh, uh, the activities of the dispute settlement system. And we're down that trail, yeah. and and it was it is surprising yeah. when you think of the the uneasiness in many parts of the world, most particularly I know a French, for instance, who didn't want any international interference with what was going on, yeah. and they began to change in the middle eighties. Uh, Europeans did. They said, "Hey, the U.S. is going awry. It's going out and doing too many things unilateral. We got to rein that in." And so that was why one of the reasons why they wanted a dispute settlement system that was powerful enough to control U.S. unilateralism, and that succeeded because yeah. yeah. U.S. unilateralism was greatly reduced, if not vanquished, at that point. The the rate of compliance is actually remarkably high. Isn't it, it is. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's uh, it's not perfect, but it's about it's somewhere around ninety percent, which is mm -hmm. not bad. Yeah, it's a little bit how you count. Yeah, but uh, I think that's correct. Yeah. Actually, the rate of and the compliance, there, there are special remedy measures, of course, in, in the text of the uh, Uruguay Round. But um, that, those remedy me measures, I think, are not the ones that really create the good compliance. Mm. I think there's a sense in policymakers in the world that if you don't have this, things could be much worse. Yeah. Well, it's interesting that you say that because if you think back a couple of decades ago, when you would have summits at head of state and, yes. and government level, yes. mm -hmm. these trade disputes would be on the agenda. You'd That's be talking right. about, you know, I don't know, lamb quotas or, or soybean restrictions Absolutely. or things like this at the very highest levels. Mm -hmm. Now the agenda is cleared of this. They know there's a system in mm -hmm. place that they can rely on and they just leave it to that. Well, they don't entirely leave it. Uh, I mean, you get into some very big cases like the airline cases, you know, Boeing and, mm. and so on. Uh, so there's still a tendency to flow into the politics. Uh, well, yeah, mm -hmm. it's, it's a, this is a political place. That's right. L let me change gears just a, a second here, John. You were in 2005 and 2004 part of the eminent person group that former Director General Supachai Panich Pankin right. created mm -hmm. and uh, under the chairmanship of Peter Sutherland, another former uh, WTO DG, mm -hmm. uh, and you came <clears throat> with a variety of recommendations. Um, do those stand up today? And if you could make some recommendations on how we could improve mm -hmm. the functioning of the mm -hmm. WTO, dispute settlement-wise or, or otherwise, mm -hmm. what, what sorts of ideas have you got? I, first of all, I don't think the, that particular report has had much effect, unfortunately. I think it was um, largely kind of put aside, you know, perhaps in the, in the uh, shadow of the negotiations coming on and so on. So there really hasn't been much that I could say that it was derived from the things in that report. Mm. Now the report was not too strong, mm. actually. It was uh, fairly, and some people would argue, fairly timid in what it was recommending. But or it would realistic. be worth, yeah, or realistic, exactly. And it, and it was there were worthwhile ideas. One of them was to try to come to grips with the consensus rule. Mm. Uh, and that's a real tough uh, thing to handle because it takes a consensus to change it. Right, right. Um, but uh, we tried, and there's some opinion in that report that tries to uh, do a little scratching at the surface of the consensus rule mm. to make it um, not 
quite so fixed and rigid right. as to destroy the operation of, of the decision making of the or, of the organization, and that I think would be almost my first priority uh, uh, moving forward. And if I recall well, it was based on it has to be your national interest if you're going to stand yes, up. Yes, that this was actually the European solution. They have they had a similar problem in their jurisprudence, right, right. and that's one of the things that they were suggesting, and we carried that forward in our report and said, well, that's an idea that might work at the international level, but so far it hasn't. Do, do you think that maybe the consensus principle has in fact been reinforced by the success of the dispute settlement system, given the fact that you are legally bound by your commitments mm -hmm. when you sign on the line, you know that uh, if you don't uphold the terms of the contract that you've just mm -hmm. uh, just signed, you run the risk of, of landing in court. Uh, and if you went to a system whereby consensus was not the mode of, of decision making, and you had this binding legal element, and let's say there was an agreement that was reached on a majority vote, and you were among those in the minority, um, it would be pretty difficult under those circumstances mm -hmm. to, to uh, coerce a member to go along with a ruling that they had never signed up to, don't you think? That's true, I, and I don't think we could ever have a majority rule mm -hmm. idea. Mm -hmm. uh, the question is, uh, how much would we uh, depart from the, the full consensus idea, the 100% veto for everyone? Uh, and there are these ideas, and, it, and they need more attention because you, you can't run the world or any part of the world with a full consensus uh, idea. And I think you see this, in, incidentally, in some broad aspects of history going back even, uh, even centuries. Yeah. When, you, when you find an institution, one that comes to my mind was early Polish uh, behavior. The, uh, the barons were not able to make a good government because the, the, everybody had a veto. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, that, that is crucial, I think. Yeah. It's really one of the conundrums that we face going forward. Absolutely. Yeah. The more actors you have on the stage, and now we have a, a, a many, right. many more actors right. than we had mm -hmm. in the Uruguay round, for example. Yeah. It gives us, I think, more, more credibility, uh, more integrity. I agree. But it, mm -hmm. it makes it more complicated yeah. as well. Uh, that's one of the things. You can't really have a majority rule yeah. because you can, you'd have a minority of the population of the world represented. Yeah. I, I did the math on this. Incidentally. <laughs> I tallied up. And what did it tell you? About uh, the, the – uh, they're confined – if you put it all together, it's, it's only hypothetical. Uh, you put it all together, uh, if you confine the voting to p people at, say, the lowest – poorest or uh, least populous, less than, just slightly more than 100% of those mm -hmm. would kill uh, an action. I see. I and see. Uh, so, and, uh, the, and the population involved would be something like, I've forgotten, 6 7% or something of the world. So yeah. you can't really run the world with no. that either. No. You have to have some, something that... Uh, uh, able to give recognition yeah. to the size and power of individual countries. One nation, one state is really at, at peril in all this, of course. Multilateralism is messy. Yeah, yeah it is. It is. Uh, one final question. The, you're seeing a, a really a preponderance these days of, of regional preferential trade yes. negotiations yes. underway, whether yes. it's uh, uh, the, the newly announced uh, North Asian discussions, the TPP. Uh, a variety of other bilateral, a, a huge, a huge number of, of different mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. undertakings, uh, the spaghetti bowl, as Jagdish Bagwadi calls it. Do you view these as, a, in some way, a threat to the uh, the multilateral trading system? I view them as a potential interesting direction for moving ahead. Mm -hmm. um, tricky, very tricky, uh, but uh, if you get a large part of the world, like Asia, in the TPP uh, it, to come on board with a, a really important uh, free trade agreement, if you will, for them, then the Europeans have got to look at that pretty carefully. Chances are they're going to have to sign on to something comparable. And then if then, then others are going to have to say, oh, I, I can't stay out. You could get this 
uh, accumulated uh, report going, rapport going, which could carry you all the way to free trade in, yeah. in theory. Yeah. You see, now it's not going to quite happen that way, but I think it could end up being pretty constructive. Why not just do it multilaterally? It could be much easier. Yeah. Well, you, uh, you, the problem is the vote, the yeah. consensus. One yeah. of the things you could do with a side agreement uh, of a, of a uh, uh, subset of the world is you can tailor the rules, right. including the rules of decision making. Right. Uh, yes. And you could have a sort of WTO plus. That's right. Or WTO minus. That's depending right. Depending on how you want to do well, it. Well, I think a plus would be the case. Yeah. John Jackson, many thanks for being with us. Well, thank you for having me. And it's always fun. And many thanks to you for joining us. Thank you very mm -hmm. much. Mm -hmm. The next is um, agreement on uh, sanitary and phytosanitary measures, all right? This, as you may have heard and read my notes, and also the um, presentation I made in the PowerPoint that was uploaded some weeks back, it is to do with uh, protection of human, animal, and plant life and health. And the agreement, all right, and the agreement basically, all right, is it deals with, all right, deals with the application of sanitary, phytosanitary measures, which were entered into force, force with the establishment of WTO uh, in 1995, 1st January 1995. And what it contains, all right, it contains the uh, basic rules, basic rules and regulations for food safety, animal, plant, uh, health standards which directly or indirectly affect international trade. Now, also, there are three international bodies, bodies who deal with standards and measures. And so if any member country wishes to come up with any rules internally to, to protect, all right, this, uh, the human life, animal, or plant, or health, you know, they have to follow the standards set by this uh, three international bodies which I discussed uh, in depth in my lecture, uh, one of which was something to do with, you know, codex as an example about labeling, uh, labeling of items, they must follow the rules of the, the international organization, um, uh, labeling is one, the other is uh, when it comes to uh, requirements uh, that that one would like to come up with in terms of protection of human uh, lives within. They need to follow certain rules and, and that body, international body has a standard where member countries of WTO must, must follow. And so this really is about protection, right? Uh, the uh, san san sanitary and phytosanitary phyto measures. Uh, it's to do with, like as I said, protection of human, animal and plant life. And out. Now, I also have a video because I believe, you know, watching video and listening to the uh, commentators commenting on this agreement makes it a lot easier. After you know, going through my my notes, my presentation, and listening to another expert in that in that area, another person who has knowledge in that area, will try to help you to really understand uh, this agreement. So, I will ask that you. Go, you know, watch this video and follow through uh, with regards to uh, sanitary and phytosanitary measures. The agreement on the application of sanitary and phytosanitary measures, also known as the SPS agreement, is an international treaty of the World Trade Organization. It was negotiated during the Uruguay round of the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade and entered into force with the establishment of the WTO at the beginning of 1995. Broadly, the sanitary and phytosanitary measures covered by the agreement are those aimed at the protection of human, animal or plant life or health from certain risks. Under the SPS agreement, the WTO sets constraints on member states' policies relating to food safety as well as animal and plant health with respect to imported pests and diseases. 
There are three standards organizations who set standards that WTO members should base their SPS methodologies on. As provided for in Article 3, they are the Codex Alimentarius Commission, World Organization for Animal Health and the Secret Areas of the International Plant Protection Convention. The treaty targets scientifically unfounded barriers to trade disguised as health and safety regulations. The SPS agreement is closely linked to the Agreement on Technical Barriers to Trade, which was signed in the same year and has similar goals. The TBT emerged from the Tokyo Round of WTO negotiations and was negotiated with the aim of ensuring non-discrimination in the adoption and implementation of technical regulations and standards. History and Framework of the SPS Agreement As GATT's preliminary focus had been lowering tariffs, the framework that preceded the SPS Agreement was not adequately equipped to deal with the problems of non-tariff barriers to trade and the need for an independent agreement addressing this became critical. The SPS Agreement is an ambitious attempt to deal with NTBs arising from cross-national differences in technical standards without diminishing government's prerogative to implement measures to guard against diseases and pests. Main provisions. Article 1 General Provisions outlines the application of the agreement. Annex A1 Definition of SPS measures. Article 2 Basic Rights and Obligations. Article 2.2 Requires measures to be based on sufficient scientific analysis. Article 2.3 states that members shall ensure that their sanitary and phytosanitary measures do not arbitrarily or unjustifiably discriminate between members where identical or similar conditions prevail, including between their own territory and that of other members. Sanitary and phytosanitary measures shall not be applied in a manner which would constitute a disguised restriction on international trade. Article 3 Harmonization Article 3.1 To harmonize sanitary and phytosanitary measures on as wide a basis as possible, members shall base their sanitary or phytosanitary measures on international standards, guidelines or recommendations where they exist except as otherwise provided for in this agreement, and in particular in paragraph 3. Article 3.3 allows members to implement SPS measures higher than if they were basing them on international standards where there is a scientific justification or the member determines the measure to be appropriate in accordance with 5.1-5.8. Annex A3 outlines the standard setting bodies. Article 5 Risk Assessment and Determination of the Appropriate Level of SPS Protection Article 5.1 Members shall ensure that their sanitary or phytosanitary measures are based on an assessment as appropriate to the circumstances of the risks to human, animal or plant life or health. Taking into account risk assessment techniques developed by the relevant international organizations, Annex A4 outlines risk assessment process. Article 5.5 Each member shall avoid arbitrary or unjustifiable distinctions in the levels it considers to be appropriate in different situations. If such distinctions result in discrimination or a disguised restriction on international trade, Article 5.7 echoes the precautionary principle where there is no science available with which to justify a measure. Cases Some of the most important WTO cases regarding the implementation of SPS measures include EC, hormones, Japan, agricultural products, Australia, salmon, Japan, apples, genetically modified organisms. In 2003, the USA challenged a number of EU laws restricting the importation of genetically modified organisms in a dispute known as EC Biotech, arguing they are unjustifiable and illegal under SPS agreement. In May 2006, the WTO's dispute resolution panel issued a complex ruling which took issue with some aspects of the EU's regulation of GMOs but dismiss many of the claims made by the USA. A summary of the decision can be found here. 
hormone-treated beef. Another prominent SPS case is the hormone-treated beef case. In 1996, the USA and Canada challenged before the WTO dispute settlement body a number of EU directives prohibiting the importation and sale of meat and meat products treated with certain growth hormones. The complainants alleged that the EU directives violated, among other things, several provisions of the SPS agreement. The EU contended that the presence of the banned hormones in food may present a risk to consumers' health and that, as a consequence, the directives were justified under several WTO provisions authorizing the adoption of trade restrictive measures that are necessary to protect human health. In 1997 and 1998, the WTO adjudicating bodies admitted USA and Canada claims and invited the EU to bring the directives into conformity with WTO law before end of May 1999. EU did not comply and the DSB authorized the USA and Canada to take countermeasures against the EU. The countermeasures took the form of increased custom duties applied by the USA and Canada on certain EU products including the notorious rock for cheese. In 2004, while the ban on hormone-treated meat was still in place, the EU initiated before the DSB new proceedings seeking the lifting of the countermeasures applied by the USA and Canada. EU alleged that it had collected new scientific data evidencing that the banned hormones may cause harm to consumers. According to the EU, the new scientific data provides sufficient ground for the ban on hormones, which may no more be sanctioned by the countermeasures imposed by the USA and Canada. As of January 2007, the proceedings initiated by the EU were still pending. Interaction with other WTO instruments while Article 1.5 of the TBT precludes the inclusion of SPS measures from its ambit in EC Biotech, the panel recognized that situations could arise where a measure is only partly an SPS measure, and in those cases, the SPS part of the measure will be considered under the SPS agreement. If a measure conforms with SPS under Article 2.4 of the SPS agreement, it is assumed that the measure falls within the scope of GATT. Article 20. Criticism. Economic considerations. Trade in the products subject to SPS type measures have the potential to result in significant economic gains for national economies favoring economic concerns over other important public health policy issues, however, is something that requires close scrutiny by governments and the international community. The SPS agreement reflects the precautionary principle, a principle which allows them to act on the side of caution if there is no scientific certainty about potential threats to human health and the environment. Under Article 5.7 members who enact provisional measures are obligated to seek further information on possible risks and review the measure within a reasonable period of time. The appellate body in Japan measures affecting agricultural products stated that the length of a reasonable period of time is to be assessed on a case-by-case -case basis under SPS rules. The burden of proof is on the complainant country to demonstrate that a measure violates Article 2.2 and Articles 5.1-5.8 before it can be regulated. Even though scientific evidence can never be conclusive and it is not possible to test for all health risks that could arise from importation of a certain product, impact on developing countries. It is important that the views of developing countries are incorporated into the standard setting process as the effect of exporting countries. Enacting SPS measures can be damaging to developing economies. This is partly due to these states not possessing the technology and resources needed to readily comply with certain SPS requirements. Impact of consumer pressure on adherence to the SPS agreement 
Some commentators pose that the WTO's assumption that trade liberalization enhances consumer welfare has resulted in the SPS agreement being ill-equipped to deal with trade restrictions put in place by governments responding to protectionist pressure from consumers. This was most noticeable in the beef hormones dispute where, although the science pointed to the relative safety of the growth hormones in question, European consumers pressured governments to ban the import of hormone-treated beef. Next, and this is the, um, the last topic that I said I was going to uh, talk about, and this is to do with technical barriers to trade, right? TBT, right? TBT. What is TBT? It is a term, right, to do to do with technical barriers to trade. It refers to, you know, sometimes mandatory technical um, uh, regulations or rules, policies, standards put in place. Sometimes it's voluntary that define certain specific uh, characteristics, certain specific standards uh, that a product should have. Okay, uh, it also deals with the kind of size, shape, right design, labeling, marketing, packaging, fun yeah, functionality or performance, right? And this is also to do with procedures that are used to check whether a product is in compliance with, uh, with these requirements and are also covered by definition of WTO. This so-called uh, conformity assessment procedures can include, for example, the testing, or inspection or certification activities and so and so forth. Now all these issues are sometimes being take, taken by various WTO members for purposes of protectionism, you know, for purposes of trying to protect their own industries. And so they use this, you know, use these reasons of say for instance, or oh, packaging is not meeting the standard, the importing country standard or marking of the label is not meeting the importing country standard or labeling is not meeting the importing country standard and so they refuse they refuse importation of those products into uh, one particular country and the the reason is not because really these products do not meet the standard the reason behind such action or conduct by a country is because it tries to protect its own on industry or its own product and so it comes up with this kind of reasons of safe design size are not meeting standards of that importing country so the technical barriers to trade agreement really specifies rules as to or procedures as to how member countries should comply with all right if it is something to do with labeling or market or marking or packaging those those rules must be you know, genuine, you know, rules or measures in place. They are not there only because they want to protect their uh, in industry or their product, but they are there because there is a genuine, there is a legal reason why they are there. And so the, uh, the, the technical barriers to trade, right, uh, has, you know, certain procedures in place. And the most important procedure is conformity assessment procedures, right? This is the international standard that if there is any issue in terms of marking or labeling or packaging, you know, they must conform to the assessment procedures of WTO. If they are not, then these countries will have to rethink and relook at the internal measures that they have and try to fix it. If otherwise, WTO may, you know, uh, come up with certain measures asking the other WTO members to not to trade or to sort of uh, apply the similar treatment that this particular country has done to the other, other WTO members. So I also have a video that I would like you to watch uh, uh, in regards to TBT. So that is all for uh, this, this uh, tutorial. I would like, to, would like to thank you all for you know, listening in and I hope this uh, tutorial, video tutorial will help in terms of your understanding uh, concerning these four areas that I, I said I was going to talk about and they are WTO dispute settlement mechanism, sanitary and phytosanitary measures and technical barrier to trade. The Agreement on Technical Barriers to Trade, commonly referred to as the TBT Agreement 
is an international treaty administered by the World Trade Organization. It was last renegotiated during the Uruguay Round of the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, with its present form entering into force with the establishment of the WTO at the beginning of 1995 binding on all WTO members. Purpose the TBT exists to ensure that technical regulations, standards, testing, and certification procedures do not create unnecessary obstacles to trade. The agreement prohibits technical requirements created in order to limit trade, as opposed to technical requirements created for legitimate purposes such as consumer or environmental protection. In fact, its purpose is to avoid unnecessary obstacles to international trade and to give recognition to all WTO members to protect legitimate interests, according to own regulatory autonomy. Although promoting the use of international standards, the list of legitimate interests that can justify a restriction in trade is not exhaustive and it includes protection of environment human and animal health and safety, structure of the agreement on technical barriers to trade. The TBT agreement can be divided into five parts. The first part defines the scope of the agreement which includes L products, including industrial and agricultural but not sanitary and phytosanitary measures. The second part sets out the obligations and principles concerning technical regulations. The third part addresses conformity and assessments of conformity. The fourth part deals with information and assistance, including the obligation of nations to provide assistance to each other in drafting technical regulations. Lastly, the fifth part provides for the creation of the Committee on Technical Barriers to Trade and sets out the dispute settlement procedures. Scope of Application According to Art. 1, this agreement covers all industrial and agricultural products, with the exception of services, sanitary and phytosanitary measures and purchasing specifications prepared by governmental bodies for production or consumption requirements of governmental bodies. The scope of the TBT consists of substantive scope, personal scope, and temporal scope. Substantive scope There are three categories of substantive measures found in Annex 1 of the TBT, Technical Regulations, Standard, and Conformity Assessment. The appellate body in ECAS best is held these to be a limited class of measures. Technical Regulation Annex 1.1 A technical regulation is a document stipulating conditions that is mandatory. The measures may include terminology, symbols, packaging or labeling requirements, and may apply to a product, process or production method. The appellate body in E.C. Sardines found there to be a three-step test for determining whether a measure is a technical regulation. The measure applies to an identifiable product or group of products. B. It lays down one or more characteristics of the product, and C. Compliance with the product characteristic is mandatory. If a measure is found to be a technical regulation, it will be regulated by Article 2 TBT, Standard. Annex 1.2 A Standard is a document approved by a recognized body that stipulates guidelines or characteristics that are not mandatory. It may include terminology, symbols, packaging or labeling requirements, and may apply to a product, process or production method. Standards are distinct from technical regulation in that they are not mandatory. Despite being voluntary, producers often have no choice but to comply with them for commercial practicality. Standards are guided by Article 4 TBT and Codes of Good Practice. Conformity Assessment Annex 1.3 A conformity assessment is a direct or indirect procedure used to determine the fulfillment of requirements in a technical regulation or standard. Conformity assessments may include sampling, testing, and inspections. The rules for conformity assessment are outlined in Articles 5, 6, 7, 8 and 9 TBT. Issues of scope determining whether a measure is a technical regulation or a standard whether a measure is a technical regulation as opposed to a standard centers on whether it is mandatory. 
the panel and a perlate body in tuna dolphin GAC case held that the U.S. labeling measures for dolphin safe tuna was a technical regulation. The requirements were not compulsory for the sale of tuna in the U.S., however the requirements were compulsory for dolphin safe certification. The appellate body stated that because the U.S. provided no other methods of obtaining the dolphin safe label, the requirement was binding, and therefore de jure mandatory. It appears from this decision that measures that attempt to obtain a monopoly over a specific label will be deemed technical regulations, but the test is ultimately on a case-by-case -case basis. This decision has been criticized for construing the term mandatory too broadly, rendering the distinction between technical regulations and standards meaningless. Application to non-product related processes labeled such as free range, organic, or fair trade, denote a quality in the product that has no tangible effects. Whether labels regarding non-product related process or technical regulations is the subject of controversy. Annex 1.1 states that technical regulations apply to product characteristics or their related process and production methods, implying that this does not extend to NPRPs. However, the second sentence of Annex 1.1 and 1.2 omits the word related, suggesting that technical regulations may apply to labeling. Some academics argue that sentence 2 is read in context of sentence 1, and should therefore be given narrower scope. The panel in Tuna Dolphin GAC case did not clarify this issue, but held in that case that the dolphin safe labeling was a technical regulation by reason of the second sentence. Resultantly, it may be assumed that labeling of NPRPPEPM products now fall under the scope of technical regulations. Key principles and obligations. Non-discrimination members must ensure that technical regulations and standards do not accord treatments less favorable to imported products compared to the ones granted to like products of national origin or creating in any other country, as established respectively in Art 2.1 and Annex 3d. This principle applies also to conformity assessment procedures that have to grant access for suppliers of like products originating in the territories of other members under conditions no less favorable than those accorded to suppliers of like products of national origin or originating in any other country in a comparable situation. Avoidance of unnecessary barriers to trade Article 2.2 obliges members not to create unnecessary obstacles to international trade and, on this basis, to ensure that technical restrictions are not a more trade restrictive than necessary to fulfill her legitimate objective. The article provides an inclusive list of legitimate objectives including national security requirements and the protection of animal or plant life or health. However, Article 2.5 provides that where technical standards are for the purpose of one of the legitimate objectives listed in Article 2.2 and in accordance with relevant international standards, they are presumed not to violate Article 2.2 harmonization around international standards when international standards exist. Members shall use them as a basis for their technical regulations, standards and conformity assessment procedures, unless their use seems inappropriate or ineffective in certain circumstances for achieving the pursued objective. Notification requirements The TBT agreement also obliges states to notify each other of proposed technical barriers to trade to give states the opportunity to raise their concerns before the measures come into force. Members must allow reasonable time for members to make comments, discuss their comments and to have their comments considered. Members must notify each other in relation to proposed TBT provisions when the following three conditions are satisfied. The measure must be a technical regulation or an evaluation of a conformity assessment procedure. There must either be no relevant international standard or, if there is, the measure must not conform to it. The technical regulation must have a considerable effect on international trade. 
These criteria are broader than any of the obligations regarding the content of technical regulations, which ensures that any issues which will subsequently be litigated can be identified at the earliest stage possible. However, in the case of urgent problems of safety, health, environmental protection or national security, Article 2.10 provides an alternate procedure to expedite the process. Other informations Adjudication of disputes under Article 14.1 Disputes regarding the TBT agreement are to be resolved by the dispute settlement body in accordance with Articles 22 and 23 of GATT. This requires parties to undergo the same consultation process as they would for issues arising under GATT and allows disputes involving issues arising under both the TBT agreement and GATT to be resolved simultaneously. In spite of this very few cases concerning the TBT agreement have been brought to the panel. The following list is an overview of the mechanisms that promote the TBT's mission. A. All TBT members are required to establish inquiry points, also known as TBT window, offices that provide information about the country's technical regulations, test procedures, and adherence to various international standards. B. A technical assistance program helps developing countries meet international standards and helps them get involved in the establishment of such standards.